one of the best ways that I've found to study if you're wanting to learn is to know what's taking place during the time that the book was written, who it was written by, who it was written to, and what it means. Uh, the author of Hebrews, which is kind of funny, the author of Hebrews is unknown. No one will come out and say that any particular individual wrote the book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews takes place approximately around A.D. 70. Uh, this coming, starting this coming Wednesday night, we're going to start doing a, a, a series on Ephesians. Ephesians takes place around A.D. 60 to 62. And it starts out with all of the, uh, with an issue to the church of Colossae. Uh, Paul writing about false teachers. And that when he wrote the book of Colossae, actually Paul was, a, the church at Colossae was actually established by Paul, even though Paul never even visited Colossae. But that just shows you how strong the word is. Through Paul, the church of Colossae was established. So when he wrote to the Ephesians, he wrote it concerning other numerous situations that were taking place. Over the period of time between that period, which was in the early A.D. 60s, and when the book of Hebrews was written towards the end of the 60s, early 70 A.D., the Jewish Christians were undergoing numerous trials and afflictions. And so, as we go through here today, keep in mind that these Jewish Christians are now at the point where they're thinking, do I need Christ? Why do I need Christ? And so this letter was written trying to encourage these Jewish Christians to keep Christ ever at the forefront. What's the lesson in that for us? Does that apply to us today? Do we get tempted through various means? Does Satan tempt us still today? Of course he does. And part of it to us is that no matter what takes place in our lives, we have to keep ever Christ in the forefront, don't we? Hebrews appears to be a written sermon directed to the Jewish Christians who were considering whether or not it was worthy to hold on to Christ any longer. While it is clear that they had suffered great persecution, the nature of their struggle is less certain. There may have been, uh, they may have been facing a new persecution or uh, teachings that offer an easier way than Jesus. And of course, we can see that, we can see that all through the history of, there's always been people who are offering easier ways and who are taking the doctrine and changing it to fit them, aren't they? It appears that they may have been considering a return back to Judaism as a way of lessening these tensions. In any case, the temptation to apostasy, which is falling back away from Christ, or was severe enough that uh, these beleaguered Christians were being encouraged to hold on uh, in 3.6, to persevere in 10.36, and to hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, lest they compromise Christ and the loss of blessings that have been won for them. Hebrews is a mysterious portrait of Jesus Christ seen through the lens of the Old Testament. Anybody that ever tells you that the Old Testament does not play a big portion in the lives of Christians today has not ever studied the Old Testament. The Old Testament is, the Bible refers to it as what? It takes us into the New Testament, doesn't it? And it carries it through. The Old Testament was written uh, pointing to the way of Christ, and it shows us how 
uh, the relationship between God and man all the way up until Christ came on the scene. Then we see Christ coming on the scene and changing, changing the thought pattern for the Christians at that time. The Christians at that time had lived under the Mosaic law and they were used to something happens, there's a punishment. That's the way the Mosaic law was written. Was the Mosaic law good? Absolutely. But that's the way they, they looked at life. They didn't look at life through mercy and grace, which is what Christ came telling them when he came on the earth. And they had a hard time dealing with that. So we're going to talk about that more as we go. The author's intent through Hebrews is to show the superiority of Christ over the prophets, the angels, Moses, the priests, and the Old Testament system. Jesus was the new priest with a new sacrifice that established the new covenant between God and the people. And we're going to talk about that more. Before I get started into Hebrews, one of the things I want to talk about, which I think is very, very important. Matter of fact, I think it's the most important thing for us this day and time as children of God. What do you think that is? If you could pick one aspect of your Christian life that you think is the most important, what do you think it would be? To me, it's the relationship between yourself and the Father or the Son. I think it's the one area that we, as the children of God, let go. And it's the one area that is the most important that we have. We get, sometimes we get so absorbed into the life that we live that we forget of our relationship with God. Does anybody, can anybody acknowledge with that? I know when I, can, I can think back to the time when I was a young man with a young family and life was busy. I'm sure Kevin, you can identify with that. Well, it seemed like we was always on the go. The boys were playing ball. I was working a lot of hours. And I look back at my relationship with God then versus my relationship with God now. And it took me a long time to realize that my relationship with God was the most important thing I had. Now, coming to church and sitting in a pew and listening to someone talk, being involved in church activities and doing good things, those are good things, aren't they? And they're definitely necessary. But sometimes we get so caught up in those things that that becomes our relationship. And so we have to remember that our relationship is where? Here, ain't it? And it's directly between us and the Father. And we're going to talk about that. John 10, 30 says, Jesus talking, he said, I and my Father are one. So we're going to take a look at just for a couple minutes the relationship between the Father and the Son. And we're going to see how that relationship directly reflects to us, the children. So Christ says, John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. John chapter 14, and verses 8 through 11, when Philip uh, was present Jesus to show him the Father, Jesus talking to Philip, he said, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe I and the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. 
or else believe on the account of his works. Is Christ and God, are they separate? We're going to get deep here for a minute. What is the relationship between the Father and the Son? Are they separate or are they one? Yes. They are one, aren't they? He just told us they were one. You cannot separate one or the other, can you? Have you ever thought about this? In the beginning of time, when before the earth was built, was Christ with the Father? We're going to look at it in a minute. He even goes as far as to say that through Christ, the universe was built. And I had never thought of it like that until I read it here in Hebrews. That through Christ, the universe was made. I always envisioned God the Father making everything. God spoke it into existence, didn't he? But here we see that the plan was already made, that through the Son, the world would be built and made. I never thought about Christ having a hand in the world. But not only did he have a hand in the world being made, it was made through him by the Father. Christ said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. We see that through the Old Testament, because sin had entered into the world, what was required? Sacrifices were required, weren't they? Why do you think God required sacrifices? Did you ever thought about it? Why would God require a sacrifice? Because he tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And so it pleased God that through animal sacrifices, that man's sins were forgiven for how long? Was there a time limit put on it? One year, wasn't it? Every year, the sins, the sacrifice, the priest would offer sacrifices for the sins of the people, and the sins were rolled forward one year. And that took place up until time when Christ came on the scene. And then what happened? Is there any more requirements for sacrifices? No, it is there. Christ became the perfect lamb without blemish, placed upon the cross, the plan by the Father of the love of mankind that the blood that flowed on Calvary was the last required for the remission of our sins. Physical death was conquered. Praise God. Physical death was conquered. Not spiritual death, is it? Can we still die of spiritual death? You die, you die physically. That's a give me, ain't it? We will die physically. But whether you die spiritually is up to who? It's up to you, right? If you accept Christ as your Savior, then you will not die a spiritual death. And we're going to talk more, a little bit more about that in a minute. John 1.18 says, No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has 
He has made him known. The Father has made the Son known. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So here we sit in a sinful world. We had to have someone come and die for our sins. Christ, the only one found worthy because of the relationship between the Father and the Son. The heavens were searched, the earth was searched, underneath the earth was searched, and Christ, the only one found worthy, who willingly came into a sinful world and suffered in every way so that he could be the one who sits at the Father's right hand. We're going to talk more about that in a minute as we go, as we start in the book of Hebrews. Philippians 2.8 says, The Son of God humbled himself by becoming obedient to the born of death, even death on a cross. He became obedient to who? Who did Christ become obedient to? He became obedient to the Father, didn't he? The Father required it. It had to be. That's why we have a Savior who has suffered in every way like unto us. John 6, says, No one can come to me except the Father who has sent me draws him. The relationship now we're looking at, <clears throat> relationship between the Father and the Son, now the relationship between the Son and mankind. We have the relationship with the Son. Why do we have a relationship with the Son? Why don't we just have a direct relationship with the Father? Because God turned everything over to Christ, didn't he? This world, mankind, everything in this world, and even, we're going to look at it in a minute, even everything under heaven was turned over to the Son. Now, that's a relationship. Have you ever, have you ever thought about, you know, when, a, when someone dies, and we're going to talk about heirs in a minute as we go through as we go through this, we're going to talk about Christ being the heir, and we're going to also talk about mankind being heirs to the Son. But when you leave those who have things in this life, like to heir them to somebody, don't they? In other words, you want your children to have things, so you write out a will, and you leave it to your heirs. Under man's law, there has to be a will written don't there? Or you become what's called intestate. You die without a will. What happens if you die without a will? Will your heirs get that? Probably not. They still could, but it's more than likely that won't take that won't happen. So what, what was the will of the Father? The will of the Father was the Son, wasn't it? Under the Son, how do we fit into the Son as heirs? Are we heirs of the Son? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Christ even says we were brothers and sisters. And that's amazing when, when Jesus calls you a brother or a sister, doesn't it? That's the relationship Christ wants with his children. That's the relationship Christ has with his children. That's the relationship that Christ has with the Father. That's the characteristics. You know, um, Levi, for the last, before this last lesson, for several weeks, he went over the characteristics of God. And when we look at the characteristics of God and we look at the, char the characteristics of the Son, are they similar? Oh, yes. They're very similar. So, the Son wants that relationship with mankind. And God loved mankind so much that he sent his only Son into the world to die for the sins of mankind. Because once sin entered, God has no part in sin, right? Think about the destruction that took place from the time that Adam sinned in the garden until now. Look what events took place because of that one sin. 
the relationship between God and man at that point was significantly damaged, wasn't it? So God had to set things in order, and part of that order had to be that Christ had to come and die for the sins of the world. Let's see if we can sum it up like this. Christ is both God and man, given by the Father before all ages. Man is born, talking about Christ, uh, by a fleshly mother, but by God's Spirit. Through God's Spirit, Christ was born by a fleshly mother, right? Perfect God, perfect man, equal to the Father in divinity, less than God by humanity. Had you ever thought about that? Less than God by humanity. He is both God and man. He is not two but one Christ. This was the gift of God to humanity that his Son is equal, be both God and flesh, showing both God the Father and God the Son, and showing his love for mankind. I thought that was pretty good. Romans 14, 11 says, It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, that every knee will bow before me and every tongue will acknowledge God. And who was speaking when that was written? Who, who spoke 14, 11, Romans 14, 11? Paul quoting Christ. So Christ tells us that at the end of the ages, when everyone is called before him, that every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that God is the Father. Simple enough, ain't it? I'm always reminded that when I speak to people that don't know God and who have never studied His Word, that they forget what the relationship is. They forget that they are a child of God whether they want to be or not. You know, the Bible says that whether I live, I live unto the Lord. And whether I die, I die unto the Lord. Whether I live, therefore, or die, I am the Lord's. You belong to God. Period. End of discussion. The only difference is, is what we take and do with that relationship that we have with God the Father. And we can either have the relationship with him or not have a relationship with him because... God has given us free will, hasn't he? And he wants those that love him to love him and to serve him. But if we don't, then that's a choice we make. And at the end, it's one that we have to answer for, each and every one of us. So let's take a look at Hebrews. We're going to go over the first four verses and then if we have time, we'll go over the last, from 5 down uh, through, I think it's 14. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Somebody tell me, who, who did God speak to in the past? He said he spoke to our forefathers. So who, who, did he speak, who did he speak to and how did he speak to them? What were some ways that God spoke to us in the past? He spoke to us through the prophets, did he, Mike? How else did he speak to us? Did he speak to us through the priests? What about the kings? 
Did he speak to us through the kings? Were there men that God talked to directly? He had numerous ways of talking to us, didn't he? And so, what, what did he speak to us? What did he tell us in the past? What has God spoken to us about in the past? What is, he, what is, what is the relationship that we have with the Father that the Father would need to speak to those in the past? What's some of the things he told them? Did he give them his laws? Yep. Did he tell them how to live their lives to please God? Yep. Did he speak of his love for mankind? Yep. What happened when the, when the relationship between the father and mankind, when it changed, what happened when it changed? Did it change? What happened when mankind broke God's laws? We see that happening numerous times, don't we? Happened time after time after time, especially with the Israelites. How many times did the Israelites break the laws of God? If you had enough fingers and toes, you'd probably be, wouldn't be able to count them, would you? I mean, it, it, it really amazes me when I go back and look at all the times that the Israelites broke the laws of God, time after time after time. What did God do? Did he speak to them? How did he speak to them? Well, he spoke, he at first spoke to them through mankind, didn't he? Moses, how many times took his laws to the people? Many times, didn't he? I, feel, I always felt sorry for poor old Moses. Could you imagine the things that he had to put up with? And he called them a stiff-necked people, didn't he? They complained when they first left, when Moses went up to the mountain to get the commandments. They complained, and what did they do? Made a molten calf, didn't he? Moses hadn't been gone no time, and he started making a false idol. They complained that they didn't have enough meat to eat. They complained that they didn't have enough water to drink. So what did God do? He supplied them quail over the land as far as the eye could behold. And he supplied them water out of a rock. It's amazing how God uses those things that we don't even think in terms of. Do you, would you have ever thought that water would come out of a rock? No. I mean, it's amazing the things that God did. And it's amazing God's patience and love for mankind. That shows us, again, we take a look at the characteristic of God. How God loved man so much that no matter what man did, God always provided a way. Now, did some of them die because of it? Oh, oh yeah. They sure did. And every single one of them, if I remember correctly, up to the age of 20, was it 20 or 25? I'm thinking 20, died in the wilderness, did not enter the promised land that God had given them. That's sad, ain't it? He brought them out of the land of Egypt, gave them everything, and had them right there at the cusp of going into the promised land but because they kept being disobedient, they fell in the wilderness. He would not let them enter the promised land. I always apply that to us today. Again, the importance of our relationship with the Father and the Son or the, should be their number one priority in our life. That should be held in front of us in everything that we do. We should take it to the Father and let the Father have control of it. That's how you ever keep before him. Take, take the life of David. Was David a godly man? He was, wasn't he? But when we look at his life, look at the things that he did. He had numerous sins in his life, didn't he? Numerous sins. 
when he took Bathsheba and had her husband sent to the front line and, and killed. And then what happened? His relationship with the father changed, didn't it? The one thing about David, God said David was a man after his own heart. How could David be a, God, a man after God's own heart when he continually did these sins? He always repented. David in his life, through his numerous sins, always repented of his sins to keep God the Father in that right, that right relationship. And that kept David in, the, in that good relationship with God. What about us today? Does that apply to us? We make mistakes, don't we? Will we, will we be in the right relationship if we repent and keep God at the front even though we make mistakes? Yes. God has promised us he will not leave us nor forsake us. He will always be with us even when we make mistakes. And we will. If you're like me, you'll make plenty of them. If not, I'll make enough for both of us. In these last days, in verse 2 it says, But in these last days he has spoken to us through his Son, whom he's appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. We were talking about that just a minute ago. The universe was made and formed through Christ by the Father. The Son is the radiance of God's glory. And I love this phrasing. The exact representation. The exact representation of His being. Sustaining all things by His powerful word. After He had provided purification from sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And so he became as much superior to the angels as his name that he has inherited is superior to theirs. What are angels? What is an angel? Somebody tell me what an angel is. God's messenger. Are angels made of flesh and blood? Mike shaking his head. They're not flesh and blood, are they? Angels are created beings. Who are they created by? The Father. What were they created for? They were created to serve God. Just like we were, weren't they? And we'll look at a minute... If you look down there in verse 14, it says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? They don't only serve God. Who else do they serve? They serve mankind, don't they? Do they serve mankind? Yep. Not through us. They don't serve mankind by our will. Who do they serve mankind by? God's will. But they are created beings, created by God, to serve mankind, to serve God, and then to serve mankind. We'll, go talk, we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Romans 8, 17 says, Now if we are children, then we are heirs. We are heirs of God, and we are co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may share in his glory. Why do we have to share in sufferings? Do, you want, do we want to suffer? Is suffering part of humanity? Is that part of what was brought on mankind as the sin that originally came from Adam and Eve? Yes. You know, Paul tells us that through our sufferings, as long as we stay faithful, we're put in a better relationship with God, aren't we? And it's hard for us to understand that. And it's definitely hard for us to understand that when we're going through persecutions. 
when we're going through sufferings and trials and afflictions. And it seems to be prevalent, especially in this day and time. Part of what was taking place during this time and this time span in Hebrews is that these Jewish Christians had been suffering persecution. And a lot of them were leaving Christ. A lot of them were going back into the world and leaving the faith that had held them between God and man. That's why Hebrews was written. Hebrews was written to these people uh, suffering persecution who were starting to leave Christ to remind them that all of our blessings are in Christ. Can you think of anywhere else there's a blessing? You may get some things from, man, from, from mankind, from your family or some, someone you love, but that's only temporary, isn't it? The blessings that we get from God are eternal and forever, and they will always be with us. Galatians 3.29 says, If you belong to Christ, then you are of Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So we are heirs according to Abraham's seed. Ephesians 3, 6 says, This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together of the promise in Christ Jesus. We are heirs with Christ of the promises that is to come, of Christ who will come in his glory, and he said he will come in like manner as he went, Someday he will come back for his children. He said in 1 Thessalonians, he said he'll come back in the cloud. And those who are dead in Christ shall rise first. And the rest of us will be called to meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That is the promises. That is the heirs of Christ that have lived faithfully according to the word. We have the promise of eternal salvation. Christ said he goes to prepare a place for us that where he is, we may be also. So he's going to bring his children one day to be where he's at. And that is the relationship between the father and son, and that's the relationship between the son and man. Next week, uh, Joe's going to be gone for the next two more weeks, and so we barely just touched, scratched the surface today in Hebrews of the relationship between God and the Son and the Son and man. And so for the next three, next two more weeks, we're going to continue looking in Hebrews at the relationship of the Son and mankind. Uh, I'll leave you today with these thoughts from Jude. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior and glory, majesty, power, and authority. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.